Now, the perfection of Christian virtue lies in that disposition of soul, which dares all that is arduous or difficult. Its symbol is the cross, which those who would follow Jesus Christ must carry on their shoulder. The effects of this disposition are a heart detached from mortal things. Part of that mortal thing is you. You're a mortal thing. Do you see? The effects of this disposition are a heart detached from mortal things, complete self-control, a gentle and resigned endurance of adversity. This is a very manly statement. This is the next tattoo I'll get on the back of my head. Do you see? So this will be a good one. It's, just, it's very big, but it'll be a good one. And we'll put a leaf there, and then we'll put this over top of the leaf on the back of the head. In fine, the love of God and of one's neighbor is the mistress and sovereign of all of all other virtues. See that? The love of God and of one's neighbor, because we only love God in as much as we love our neighbor. In the measure, the better way to say it, in the measure by which we love our, our, our neighbor is our love for God. It can be measured by the love of neighbor. That's how you know. Because people think that um, they can just love God and they don't have to do anything for their neighbor because they hate their neighbor because they like dogs. Because their neighbor makes, they don't like dogs and they like dogs because dogs are innocent. This is, you'll, you'll hear this nonsense when you start talking to people. And it doesn't mean that we have to like, when, you know, we have grave difficulty with a certain individual and uh, you, know, you have to be able to be friends and go to pizza. That, that's, not, that's not love of neighbor. That's wishing, praying for your neighbor that they are going to get to heaven. You want, the, you want good for your neighbor, which isn't that they win the lottery, but that they get to go to heaven. Do you see? In fine, the love of God and of one's neighbor is the mistress and sovereign of all the virtues, such as its power. And it wipes away all the hardships that accompany the fulfillment of duty and renders the hardest labors not only bearable, but agreeable. I'm just going to read this. I don't need to go into this. We've gone into this before. I've given over conferences about it. But it, it's that beautiful quote from Apocalypse 2, 5. Um, and it more has to do with the lay faithful, trying to help them understand. But I know thy works and thy labors and thy patience. And how thou, uh, thou canst not bear them that are evil. And thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. And thou hast patience and hast endured for my name. And hast not fainted. But I have somewhat against thee. This seems difficult. Like you're doing all this stuff. You're trying really hard. And still he has something against you. But what is it? Because thou hast left thy first charity. Love. You left your first love. Be mindful, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and do penance. And do thy first works, which are love. Do you see? Do your first works, which are love. What's that penance? It's the same thing when you go into a desolation. They say the way out of a desolation is to practice more fervently the faith. You're being smacked in the face by God because you're being a bad little child who's not loving him properly. And so what does he do? He scolds you a little bit. But for what reason? So that you'll love him. Desolation is overcome by a greater degree of zeal. And the way we do that is by cooperating with God's grace. You don't pick yourself up by your bootstraps and just start trying to do better for God. You start cooperating with the grace he's giving you. He's smacking you in the face because you're wasting his graces. He, he you were made to love God and you're not doing it. So he, you haven't done anything wrong. He's not looking to strike you down and throw you into hell. He's just simply saying, just start doing it right. It's the same thing when little children get a little pat on the butt from their mom. 
The kid starts crying like they just got beaten by, with a bat. Well, they didn't get beaten by a bat. The kid didn't want to be smacked on the tushy because it was, it was acting wrong. So he got a little smack on the tushy just to remind him, and then the kid's better a little bit later. But mom knows kid needs a smack on the tushy. Do you see? Or else, or else I come to thee and will move thy candlestick out of its place. You could say that the candlestick has to do with um, the divine presence. That's what I always kind of correlate it to. Because the candlesticks, when he's talking about it, he's talking about the candlestick, which would be the candlestick with seven candles on it. And there were seven candlesticks with seven candles on it because seven's a perfect number. And so it, it shows the perfection of divinity, right? If he's going to move our candlestick, what's that mean? If we're not going to, if we're not going to cooperate with the graces, like St. Alphonsus says, he's going to remove them. We just need to cooperate. This isn't to make us all scared and everything. It's, that, it's to make us want to be more fervent with a loving God who loves us and wants to give us all these beautiful things. I come to thee and will move thy candlestick out of its place except thou do penance. Our former life is a life of penance. Do you see, this is what St. Francis wanted. He wanted to be a penitent. Now, St. Francis, we know he was a good young man. He didn't do bad stuff. He went to parties and stuff like that. But that's because he had a lot of money. He liked singing. And they would go out to, you know, do whatever and that. But he's not known to be, have, have you ever committed even a mortal sin? The videos like to make him that way now because the world loves filthiness that like overcomes its filthiness somehow or maintains its filthiness. I don't know. But they, you know, some of those movies will come out now. They'll show St. Francis like a lunatic. But no, he was, a, he, was a, he was a good young man. So why did he do a life of penance? Because that's what our Lord did. And so the first thing our Lord told us to do is to do a life of penance. So what's the Franciscan life? It's a life of penance. It's a life of total donation to do penance. Why? Because Christ did penance. And he didn't have to do it. We have to do it. You look back. You remember the filthy things you used to do in the world. A lot of times in the Christian world today, or the Catholic, the small Catholic world where people still believe stuff, is knowledge tends to be their faith. They don't have a deep desire for God. They want to know all the scandal that's going on because they know more than everybody else. They have a deep faith. And you, you know that. If, if I bring that up with a group of traditional Catholics and I say that you know that's what you do at your Catholic coffee hours, all the heads do this. They know because they're the ones that do it. You see, sit there, go to coffee hour, see if you can outdo everybody with all the scandals you know about because you, that justifies why you're on your phone so you can explain to everybody how bad the church is today. That's knowledge, okay? That's not faith. Our faith isn't based on that. The desire, on the other hand, the desire would be different because the desire to love God and be united to God would keep you away from wanting to reel a filth that's out there and talking about it all the time because it would wear you down. Do you see?